Wendy to our death holler brought us season three slash or pass. It became the classic horror film podcast of its time. And now Death Holler brings us the most shocking season ever. Season four. Dead or dead. Yeah, they're dead. They're all messed up. Imagine, if you will, that one of the hosts is absolutely terrified of zombies. So, what's the plan? Bash him in the head, that seems to work out. Now, accept the fact there is no escaping this horror. Death Holler brings back the dead. Remember, when you're in Death Holler, listener discretion is advised. With hospitality like this, you'll never want to leave. We hope you stay alive. When there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk here. Welcome back to Death Holler. I'm your host, the Reverend Dr. Death, and joining me as always is the Latina who's dead and all messed up, La Urena. <laughs> Are you already dreading the season, Urena? Uh, it's amping up for sure and um, it, it coming less exciting, but I think today I was literally screaming at some point, I fucking hate zombie movies. I fucking hate them. My husband's just used to it, so he was just kind of like, oh, here we go with this bullshit. <laughs> Uh, we've made it, folks. This is the seminal moment in the Plague Zombie Genesis, the film that introduced a new monster and a slew of new tropes to go along with it, Night of the Living Dead, the movie that introduced us to my personal favorite horror director, George A. Romero, and the film that everyone in horror has seen, even if it was in passing, because an error in copyright labeling <laughs> made it public domain, and it is in fucking every horror movie uh, at some point. So, uh, I could just go on forever and probably will during the film breakdown. So let's just cut to the chase, board up those windows, make sure you burn them or take out the mm-hmm. head and join us as we look at the OG film, the 1990 remake. And we'll even throw in a little, dis- little bit of a discussion of the new animated version. Uh, first up though, if you're enjoying the podcast, we would appreciate it. If you could take the time to like comment, subscribe on whatever podcast platform you prefer. It helps us get more visibility on podcast listings and helps us grow. Also consider following us on social media. You can find us on TikTok and Twitter under death holler pod, and we can be found on Instagram and Facebook under death holler podcast. We appreciate everyone who listens and hope you enjoy the show. Um, First up, let's bridge the gap a little bit between these movies and the previous ones that were discussed. Uh, a little bit of follow-up on I Am Legend. Um, I actually heard George Romero say this on an interview that he did in uh, in Canada um, to, a, I believe, as a bunch of film students at a college. Uh, he cited I Am Legend for sure as being like one of the things that inspired him to make the movie, but not, but only like a grain of the of the story. So basically what he said was is that he read it and he thought it was very interesting and he loved the whole undead apocalypse. Yeah. But he was like, instead of having a guy who's like the last man alive, <laughs> to quote the, you know, yeah. the movie that, that Vincent Price was in, uh, or um, he wanted to see how, he wanted to film the chaos of when the apocalypse was actually starting. Okay. So that, that is why, you know, he took that and he was like, okay, that's three years on. 
let's show how the world was breaking down from the very first night that this started happening. Hell yeah. I can respect the (laughs) fuck out of that because, I mean, it's already happened, and I'm sorry, but the men at this point were kind of already, they were kind of just in a routine, so they were a lot more relaxed. When panic strikes among people, um, shit's going down. Yeah, and I think it's brilliant idea because it's like okay you can really play up the horror elements of like people dealing with like the dead rising back up and going after the living so yeah uh smart idea um he i also read in trivia that carnival of souls was actually an inspiration for him at least visually for the ghouls that he used in the first movie and i can definitely see that because if you've ever watched that older film uh, i'm not going to spoil what the story actually ends up being about but uh, this woman in the story keeps seeing these, uh, you know, basically they could be ghosts. They could, they're, they're zombies before zombies were a thing. Oh, that's, yeah. That's what they look like. I mean, they got the the pale skin, the dark circles around their eyes. They look like the zombies or the ghouls. They're creepy and, as uh, fuck. Not the living dead, yeah. So, so he took visual inspiration from that. And i would be remiss but after cody brought this up i was very surprised to see this and i did some research and it is a thing uh there is a strange uh link to the smurfs yes. with not the living dead yes there is <laughs> <laughs> so le Schrumps noir which is uh i guess uh Danish. I don't know where they're actually from. Belgium, I think. Okay. Uh, for, for the Smurfs, uh, or the Black Smurfs, as it was originally called, was a comic that was released on 11-30-1963, a whole five years before Romero ever made his movie. And it's basically, and it was redone as the Purple Smurfs. Yeah. Uh, and on 10-31-1981. Um, and Ooh, Halloween. The base- yeah, it was the Halloween episode of the the first season. Hell so yeah. pretty pretty appropriate. Uh, but the gist of it is is that while they're out doing their general labor out in the the forest, Lazy uh, Smurf, who lives up to his name and doesn't do shit, uh, is uh, being chastised by Papa Smurf and told to uh, actually do something. Basically, in the process of going to to dig or whatever he's supposed to be doing, he gets uh, bitten by a purple fly that ends up turning him into a uh, crazy, uh, basically vicious. He he wants to go around biting the other Smurfs and turning them into Smurfs or that are infected like he is. And uh, it, it spirals like I mean, one smurf after the next after they've been bitten turns into these purple like, and they good nap is what is all they can say. They've lost all ability to reason other than just uh, causing mischief and like biting uh, other smurfs and turning them. Yeah. And uh, eventually, by the end of the episode, even Papa Smurf falls to him, and it just so happens that the only thing that saves the smurfs from being totally wiped out by this thing is that the lab that he's got this pollen in blows up and it actually causes them all to turn back to normal. But <laughs> it's got all it's got all the tropes. I mean, yeah. an infection that's spreading by bites. Uh, they all turn evil and, and, and incoherent. They, all they can think of is just violence. And, um, and it's even got the apocalyptic thing because, the, I mean, the entire Smurf village is turned by the end of it. Oh, yeah, and Papa Smurf specifically <laughs> says, we have to do something before we are no longer... <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, he even mentions that it's an infection that they, you know, that they're, you know, contracting. So uh, he seen it 108 years ago. Yeah, that that spread 108 years before that, and he couldn't remember what the actual treatment was for it. Very, very strange that like that exists, and then Night of the Living Dead comes out, and it kind of takes that whole thing and runs yeah. with it. Somebody gets bitten. You know what? I couldn't help but notice that. Ever, apparently, every Smurf's butt's over here looking like a snack because that's where they were all biting each other, right on the buttocks. <laughs> yeah, they uh, they like to get a uh, bit on the booty in that episode yeah. uh, quite a bit. Uh, and it's kind of funny at one point when Papa Smurf's telling them that, you know, they need to uh, be finding a cure for it. Uh, he's He's got them all together. He, he's... I mean, this was brought up on a podcast I was listening to, but it's 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 true. He's like the worst leader ever. He's got them out in the open. They're all game together, and there's actually some getting bit while he's giving the, oh, yeah. the speech that he's giving. So yeah, that was hilarious. It's just all of a sudden he, he's like, "There's 14," then you hear ah, 15, ah, 16. You know, the number just keeps growing. 
uh it's actually kind of creepy at the end though when he's when the him and uh, smurfette and like two or three others have like the the pollen and they're all trying to like spray the affected smurfs and like, oh yeah and they're just they're closing them. in on them yeah yeah they're turning them but there's so many of the purple smurfs that they're actually turning them back mm -hmm. as soon as they they uh uninfect them yeah uh, uh it i, I just when I heard about this, I was like, there's no fucking way. And I, and I looked it up and, and that comic for sure came out before Night of the Living Dead, which is really weird. I mean, I like that cartoons choose to have horror elements. I do love that Night of the Living Dead could partially have been inspired by this. And I do also love that our Garfield cartoon that we did for um, The Fog. Yeah. Yeah. The one I love that they just totally like ripped off of that and made a decent horror cartoon for us kids to watch to, after we were done trick or treating, you know? Yeah. It's, I, I appreciate it whenever they actually go. I mean, there's enough there to keep the kid from feeling like too, you know, scared or yeah. whatever, but there, but there's, there's horror to it. Like, it's not just like, you know, oh, it's uh, this is never a thing they'll ever hurt you. No, I mean it's the best kid stuff. There's a little bit of danger to it. Oh, definitely. You know? Um, which again is why I like the original Hocus Pocus, and I hate that remake because I feel like there was no threat to anybody in that movie. Like the Sanderson, yeah, and nobody were, was even scared or even that concerned. It was, yeah. Yeah, like the Sanderson sisters were just being were just jokes in that movie. But yeah. we're not here to review that. I'm just it still boggles me that that they went that route. We're because... not here to review it, folks, because we already did. You can go back to <laughs> <laughs> previous, uh, probably around the time Hocus Pocus came out, part two, and you can listen to that. Uh, but anyways, uh, if you if you have a chance, it's on um, it's on uh, YouTube. YouTube. Look up the Purple Smurfs, and you can watch the episode. It's pretty interesting. You know what? I'll post it in the show notes, and I will also post it in um, on our Facebook pages, Instagram, whatever for people. Well, not Instagram, but Twitter, whatever. If you guys check it out, um, you'll see the link there, and you can go watch it. It's twelve minutes long, worth every minute of your time. I, I highly recommend you go see it. Uh, all right. Uh, with all that said. Uh, let's move on to Night of the Living Dead, Ooh, 1968. Right. Before we do that, I'm sorry. We're going to attack some bees real quick. <gasps> what, what is that? What is that? What is it? Oh, no, not the bees. Not the bees. Ah! Out of my eyes. Okay, now this is scaring me. You're, uh, <laughs> you usually don't attack those bees, so what do you got for me today? You're going to absolutely hate it. You're going to hate it so much. Um, <laughs> what I have is called Night of the Day of the Dawn of the Sun of the Bride of the Return of the Revenge of the Terror of the Attack of the Evil Mutant Alien Flesh-Eating Hellbound Zombified Living Dead. Uh, I hate everything about it. <laughs> My husband made me, he told me about it last night. He made me watch it today. I made it almost exactly 24 minutes before I shut it off. <laughs> now, tell me if any of this sounds familiar to you. I'll lay, I'll name a few key principal players, um, and then uh, you can tell me what you, what you're thinking. Uh, we've got principal players of one Dwayne Jones. He played Ben. He's our flawed hero. Uh, <laughs> we have okay. Judith O'Day. She plays Barbara. We have okay. Carl Hardman. He plays Harry Cooper, a conservative, cowardly asshole. <laughs> are, are are you reading off my notes for uh, Not Living Dead 1968? Yes, I am. And I'm not going to continue because you get the gist of it. This oh, was, basically they took Not Living Dead and just redid it is they, what you're telling they me. They dubbed over it. It was, a, it was not Mystery Science Theater 3000. It was Mystery Science Theater 1000 before they became good. I mean, and it wasn't even them. It was just a version of where they have a bunch of sound effects. And of course you got men uh, doing the women's voice acting uh, and that stupid little, Oh my God. Kind of mini, you know, mini mouse, Mickey mouse voice. Um, you know, that explains something because when I was doing the research and I was like looking up like the things that some of the, that the original not living dead actors have been in, they, a lot of them lifted or listed some kind of laugh tracks thing. And that's yes. exactly what that is. Yes. Um, it's God awful. Some of it's pretty funny. Uh, did it take away the scares from me? I'm going to spoil you right now. It did not. There was still <laughs> the scary parts. There were still scary. 
great to me. Um, and the the audio is so fucking terrible that it just made it it made it harder to watch because like it'd be one thing like I don't care if the audio sounds crappy because they're trying to accomplish something. It's just that the jokes weren't really hitting. Um, they it's like they wanted to use it's like they had a soundboard and they wanted the opportunity to use every sound on that soundboard. Yeah. So um, that's is it kind of like the zoo crew guys that are always on in the morning. It's like, you're here with uh, yes. Rico and the Rob, you exactly know, like exactly that, sort of that. Um, there was even one part, there was a couple of breaks in the movie, which seemed very, um, what are those movies you said you wanted me to make our intro sound like the type of movies, um, Oh God, what am I thinking of? Uh, it, <sighs> You know what type of films I'm talking about? You used to see them at theaters. Uh, ho- they're not horror films, but they were like short films. Uh, uh, you're talking about like those little uh, trailers uh, yes. for like the the interludes or whatever yes. between like movies. Yeah, yeah. So they they had a lot of those. One of them was basically telling Jorm- telling George Romero, "Don't get mad at us. Why the hell did you not get a copyright on this? What were you thinking?" <laughs> I'll get into the trivia on how that happened, and I feel so bad for yes. how, it, how that went about. Understandably. So that is my Attack of the Bees. Uh, like I said, I made it almost exactly 24 minutes into it before I was like, I I can't do this anymore. I, I don't know how you make it through all of your B movies. I know some of them are good to you. This was, this was not even funny. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, I'm sorry that you had, if you had to give it a Nick Cage rating, <laughs> oh, what God. would you give it? Oh, it, I, it's not even, to me, it's not even worth a Nick Cage rating because I can't think of a movie bad enough to describe a, a, a Nick Cage movie bad enough to describe this. Not, not even close. Yeah, he's usually pretty entertaining, even in his worst yes. movies. I yes. mean, yes, I, I I don't have anything. There's no Nick Cage rating for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Steer clear. All right. Well, I'm sorry that that one didn't live up to uh, it, the name. I mean, with a name that long, you figure it would have <laughs> been epic in some way, but it was god awful. Uh, all right, folks. Not of the Living Dead. 1968, the OG that started all the zombie movies that we know now. Um, Tagline, if it doesn't scare you, you're already dead. Oh, God. Well, I'm still alive. (laughs) Uh, Directed by George Romero. uh, Written by John A. Russo and George A. Romero. Budget of $114,000 made $30.24 million. Okay, that's a high budget for, for the 60s, yeah? Uh, no, not really. Okay. I mean, there was, I mean, that's bottom of the barrel. I mean, okay. you know, they, okay. uh, scraped, they scraped together everything they could from their little advertising uh, group that they, uh, uh, would always, uh, you know, make, uh, just commercials with a latent image, I believe is the name of the group. And, uh, they got like the people who worked there, um, and uh, basically anybody that they that they could get that was tangential to come in and help them out on it. So, I mean, it was shoestring. Yeah. Oh, definitely, because uh, in Night of the Dawn of the Day of the Living of the Son of the Bride of the Whatever, they basically, they start the movie off with, back in such and such, George A. Romero grabbed friends, family members, and random cast members to put together this, blah, blah, blah. We found flaws in the audio, so we updated it. And it's like, did, did you? <laughs> Sounds like you downgraded it, but pop off. Uh, and I didn't list music because, and this is very interesting, it was so shoestring that George Romero could not, and, and they didn't know anybody who actually did music uh, or scoring. Uh, so what he did was he was used to using what they call library pieces okay. uh, to do commercials with, which is basically like there was a, stock music that they used for like a lot of 1950s uh like movies and so he went and and paid a like license fee to get this stock music uh to just base and he mixed and matched to get the the music in the movie that's smart it works shit that's what Um, we did for our fucking intro song for death holler i didn't appreciate it until i was listening to a guy talk about it um, he used like over 20 some cassettes, like 
pieces from each one of them and 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 tied them in together so that they worked like flowing one to the other so i mean you know if it sounds cheesy that's fine but just remember that he took a huge library of music and like picked the best to fit the scene i mean and 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 when you watch it i mean especially the scenes where it's got that thrumming, like sci-fi, like especially the, the one I think of all the time is the the zombies, like the extended scene where they're sitting there and they're eating, like yeah. the uh, the flesh of like Tom and Judy or whatever outside, and and it's going and it's just that thrumming like sound that it's that's doing that that's perfect for that scene, like it it really is. I mean, it's creepy and it's uh, I mean, it's just got this weird like almost heartbeat like to it or something. So. Yeah. Uh, principal players, we have Dwayne Jones, who plays Ben, our flawed hero. Um, these people were never uh, professionals, so okay. they don't they don't have a lot to to go with their names. Uh, he ended up doing a movie later on in life called Vampires and to Die For. He, he was set- also in a movie, Night of the Day of the Dawn of the Son of the Bride of the something. <laughs> I, it does a lot, but he was in that movie too. Yeah, I think every one of these people were in that movie. <laughs> um, He, sadly, he died at 51 years old. Fuck. Died of a heart attack in 1988 or 89. I think he's 89. Goddamn. Um, And uh, he spent his last years as a college professor slash, uh, like, theater director for, like, in in New York, I think, which is where he was living at. Actually, at the time when he filmed this, he came back down to Pennsylvania as, like, a... uh, uh, kind of a favor to George and some of the other people because he grew up, you know, uh, grew up with them. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, that's where, and that's where he was at whenever he passed away. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> Judith O'Day plays uh, Barbara in the movie, who's our catatonic female. Um, <laughs> she, uh, she goes nuts and just never comes back. Well, she technically comes back right at the end, but then she sees her brother and then she loses it all over again. So yeah. she's, She's there for a second, and then she's gone. Uh, she ended up doing a movie later on called Night of the Living Dead Genesis, and then uh, and then another movie called Abandoned Dead. She's actually still doing stuff. She's doing voice work for some of these, like, knockoffs. Okay. You know, like, which is surprising because, I mean, I would have thought, I mean, I guess they're not that old, but she has to be, like, in her 80s or something at this point. But. Um, Hold on. Let me see real quick if it gives me. There she is. Judith O'Day, she is 78 years old. Okay. Yeah, I was thinking she was getting close. Not bad. Uh, Carl Hardman plays Harry Cooper, who's the conservative, cowardly asshole in the movie. Uh, Father to uh, Karen, uh, husband to uh, Helen. And um, the guy did a ton of shit in the background. Like, he uh, did, I mean, like, the stuff that he... His name's associated with like five or six different things as far as the production of this movie. So, in, in addition to the fact that, and it's actually his daughter playing his daughter in this movie. So there's that. okay, that's that's crazy. <laughs> uh, so it was very much like, uh, who can we get and can they do like five things for us at the same time? Yeah, you know, I type mean, movie. it makes sense, you know. Uh, Marilyn Eastman plays Helen Cooper, uh, who's Harry's long-suffering wife and then Karen's mother. Uh, she actually did the makeup for the movie, like the zombie effects. Uh, and she's actually a zombie in the movie, the one that's outside, like, eating something off of a tree. Uh, that's that's actually her, and she's covered up in so much makeup that she did herself that she doesn't even look like the same person. Nice. Um, her and Carl were both in a movie called Santa Claus, C-L-A-W-S. Um, <laughs> Sandy Claus, and I'm just kidding. And uh, she also did some kind of, like, a uh, thing called Chiller Theater at one point in time where she was a vampire-like character on that. Um, and I got to say, she was the nice looking woman. You watch this movie and I think she's the, I'm definitely the prettiest one in, in oh, the movie. Oh, yeah. I mean. Her hair is done super nice. She's gorgeous. She's just annoying as fuck. <laughs> uh, Keith Wayne plays Tom, who's an all-American boy. Uh, Keith Wayne apparently was like a musician of some kind out of like South Carolina before he did this. And this is the only movie to his name. Okay. And then he became a chiropractor after this. Oh, Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, Judith uh, Ridley plays Judy, who's the all-American girl that's uh, uh, dating or engaged to, to Tom. It kind of depends on the movie, I think. Yeah. Uh, but uh, she only did one other movie besides this. There's always Vanilla, a.k.a. The Affair, which is George Romero's attempt at like a romantic type movie that he did right after this. Of course, that, that bombed. He tried a couple of th- more things, and then he was like, fuck it. You all want zombies? I'm giving you Dawn of the Dead. And then he became famous for that. And in the story, but, um, uh, he tried to get out of horror after this, like to branch out, but it didn't work for him. Yeah. Uh, Judith was actually just a receptionist who worked for, uh, Marilyn Eastman and, uh, Carl Hardman, because actually they were lovers, Eastman and Hardman for, uh, off and on throughout the years. And, uh, Judith actually worked for him and they just came in one day and say, you got the face for a movie, just come be on our movie. And that's how she got her job. Yeah. Uh, Kara, Kara Sean, uh, uh, plays Karen Cooper, the first zombie kid. That's, I think that's like a stage name. She is, uh, uh, Carl Hardman's daughter. Uh, and I, maybe even Marilyn East. I don't know if that's their kid together is my only confusion on that. Cause I didn't see that in any of the notes. Uh, but, uh, she ended up going on like, like very recently doing a movie called day planner of the dead and the <laughs> green man day planner of the dead. Yeah. Yeah. No, stop. Uh, there's cheap zombie movies out there okay, if you want to go look for them. Okay. Uh, George Cassana plays Sheriff McClellan, who is my spirit animal. I love everything about the sheriff in this first movie. He is great. Uh, he was he went on to be in a movie called My Uncle John is a Zombie. And uh, there's always Vanilla, which he did with uh, Judith Ridley. Uh, Bill Cardell plays the field reporter. At the time, he was known as Chili Billy Cardell, who was like a horror, like radio person or whatever. Like he uh, did, like at, at, on TV, like he showed like scary movies, and then like you know had like a little persona about him. Yeah. And his daughter, his daughter actually ended up being uh, a character in my favorite Romero movie, uh, Day of the Dead, which we'll get to yes. later on in the season. <laughs> Not very long from now, folks. It's coming up. <laughs> Uh, Bill Hensman plays the graveyard zombie, who is the first ever zombie on film. So let's give him a little uh, round of applause, folks. Oh. And um, I want to make a note here on him. So when you watch that graveyard zombie at the man in this movie, he is very aggressive and very quick versus all the rest of the Romero zombies. Yeah. They filmed that the very last thing of the movie. I'm just going to throw the trivia out there on that. Okay. They got to the, and he'd already played. If you watch the movie, he's in the movie previous to this. Like, and you can see him out and he's just, you know, slowly walking with the rest of the zombies. He doesn't have that animation to him like he does at the beginning yeah. of the film. He brought it up to uh, Romero's attention. They got to the scene where the zombie has to break the glass. And he told Romero, he's like, we've already filmed these zombies being slow. You told me to, uh, because see, he wasn't supposed to do this part. It was supposed to be somebody else. Then on the day, Romero was like, hey, you want to come back and play this character? That's going to be the first ever. And he's like, sure, whatever. Yeah. And uh, he got there, and he was like, hey, George, he's like, these zombies are supposed to be slow. I'm never going to break this window. And George looked at him and said, fuck it, just do it. Yeah. And so so he had to make this character more animated to break that glass and do all the stuff that needed to be done to bring in the movie. So at first, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, did you just know? I mean, was was this filmed first and Romero hadn't like you know cemented the idea? No, it was filmed last, and Romero was like, "We're about out of money. Just fucking do it. Just, Let's get yeah. this over with. Let's wrap it up." <laughs> <laughs> so that's the reason he moves quicker than the rest of them. Oh my god. Synopsis: After a space probe returns from Venus with a strange radiation, the newly deceased begin to reanimate and attack the living, eating their flesh. Ew. Unfortunately for Barbara and Johnny, this happens while they are visiting a cemetery to place flowers upon their father's grave. Barbara barely escapes being a ghoul, ghoul chow, only to find herself in seemingly abandoned farmhouse. Uh, through the course of the night, a group of strangers uh, real, come together and realize they must barricade themselves from the living dead in order to survive. Will they be able to work together to overcome this new plague on society? Spoiler alert, no. Uh, ben is in charge upstairs. Harry needs to grow a pair. <laughs> and Barbara is a comatose nothing. N- not responsible for any missing bodies or cannibalistic acts, which is another tagline. Oh, God. 
some other taglines. Uh, they keep coming back in bloodthirsty in a bloodthirsty lust for human flesh. It sounds dirty. It does. Pits the dead against the living in a struggle for survival. It's not the worst, but it's definitely not the best. They won't stay dead. I love that one. That one's good. They're, I love they're that coming, one. They're coming to get you again. I like that, but the fact that they haven't heard, unless the they're coming to get you, Barbara, was in the... Um, was I, in the think, I think that tagline, because I cut out some of the others, I mm-hmm. think that was like something they pasted on years later once the okay. movie had been out on like video and stuff. So I just feel like that'd be a good tagline for the 1990 one, or it's hard to hear that they're coming to get you again if you haven't even heard it before. So I'm hoping that maybe when he says they're coming to get you, Barbara, is in the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, the trailer. Trailer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that it would have been all right. Title for Dawn of the Dead. Maybe they're yeah. coming to get you again. You know. Yeah. Speaking of quotes, mm-hmm. they're coming to get you, Barbara. Ugh, leave me alone. S- stop it! You're ignorant. They're coming for you, Barbara. Uh, stop it! You're acting like a child. They're coming for you. And he points to the cemetery zombie. Look, there comes one of them now. He'll hear you. Here he comes now. I'm getting out of here. Like, um, I thought that was so weird because that thing was getting really, really close. And, like, I don't feel like as I would hope that my brother wouldn't let some random stranger just get that super close to me. Well, it, it, yeah, it is really weird because, like, the one thing that you notice in the 1990 version, even though they play the fake out, is whenever the old man actually does get close, Johnny actually does step in yeah. slightly whenever he sees him getting close. He don't in this when he's like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Yeah. And uh, just leaves her there. And the guy's, like, right on top of her. Like, I'd be like, uh, this guy's getting a little close to us let's get the fuck out of here yeah what the hell dude uh he's an asshole like let's just say it johnny is an asshole yeah uh the field reporter are they slow moving chief and of course sheriff mcclellan yeah they're dead they're all messed up <laughs> so notorious <laughs> Uh, those are the two famous lines in the movies by the way the come i'm coming or they're coming to get you barbara and then they're dead they're all messed up classic lines yeah uh, H- helen cooper we may not enjoy living together but dying together isn't going to solve anything no nope, that is that is um so true that line actually says quite a bit about her and uh harry's relationship too i mean helen, i mean maybe i'm thinking more of the second one but helen was a fucking soldier uh I feel like she's more of a soldier in the first movie in a way because of the second one. She's more like she stands up to him a little bit more in the second one, but at the same time, she's she's not as uh, outgoing when it comes to the everybody else, or at least to Barbara in that movie. Okay. Of course, Barbara's a different character in that movie, so yeah. that, you know. But I, she, it's almost like she played. She's trying to bring Barbara out of her like funk or whatever okay. when she first sees her. And and I don't know, like, I appreciate that more about the one in the original movie versus the new one. Yeah. Uh, Harry Cooper complaining, this place is ridiculous. Look at this. There's a million weak spots up here, and they talk about these windows. Uh, I can't see a damn thing. There could be 15 billion or million of those things out there. That's how much good these windows are. Um, the man sucks, mm-hmm. but he has valid points in this movie. Very valid points. Uh, ben, I'm telling you, they can't get in here. And then Harry, uh, and I'm telling you, they turned over our car. We were damn lucky to get away at all. Now you're telling me these things can't get through a lousy pile of wood? Yeah. He's got points, folks. Yes. Uh, and they're just Sheriff using McClellan. these tiny little nails. They're not even using, like, carpenter's nails. They're, like, they're using, like, nails you would put use to hang a poster. They use the larger nails in the, the remake yeah. at times. But in this one, yeah, they're, like, the little small you know uh i mean they would work to keep stuff up but they wouldn't like keep something from knocking the, yeah. those doors in uh sheriff Mc, sheriff mcclellan again uh good shot okay he's dead let's let's go get him that's another one for the fire boys oh my god <laughs> i just like it. he just gives two fucks about all this like everybody else is like freaking out and he's just out there living his best life uh, ben, now get the hell in the or down in the cellar. You you can be boss down there, but I'm boss up here. I mean, uh, that's pretty bold. The colored man telling the white man where to go. Back in that time period, <laughs> it was very bold. Yeah. Uh, this isn't a trivia, but 
uh, I listened to the last uh, recorded interview with uh, 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 Dwayne or whatever, and uh, he was talking about how he went from the set of this sh- this movie uh, uh, carrying uh, the entire day he had spent carrying like that uh, tire iron, like, you know, hitting the ghouls in the head with it or whatever. That was the scene that he had done. And when he got out of that, they went to somewhere, and this was in Pennsylvania, mind you. This wasn't the South. Yeah. You know, during this time period. He actually had people, uh, white guys, walk up on him with tire irons ready to beat his ass. What the hell? Night. Yeah, he, him and, and the people he was with had to drive to a safe area and, and lose those guys in order to keep from getting their, getting beat up. Jesus. While he was filming this movie. Not, wow, dude. <laughs> Um, uh, to Harry Cooper after having been locked outside, uh, Ben, I ought to drag you out there and feed you to those things. You shut up. <laughs> uh, Dr. Grimes, in the cold room at the university, we had a cadaver, a cadaver which uh, all limbs had been amputated. Sometime early this morning, it opened its eyes and began to move its trunk. It was dead, but it opened its eyes and tried to move. Uh, the world building in this movie is amazing. Yeah. It really is. Uh, newscaster, it has been established that persons who have recently died have been returning to life and committing acts of murder. A widespread investigation of funeral homes, morgues, and hospitals has concluded that the unburied dead have been returning to life and seeking human victims. It's hard for us here to be reporting this to you, but it does seem to be a fact. If you heard that on TV, uh-uh. it, it, it's over. I mean, that's... Oh, yeah. that's <laughs> Uh, Harry Cooper referring to some or to everybody else who are all upstairs. Let them stay upstairs. Let them. Uh, too many uh, ways those monsters can get in here. We'll see who's right. We'll see when they come begging me to let them in down here. And then Helen, that's important, isn't it? And then Harry's like, what? To be right. Everybody else to be wrong. And then Harry's like, what do you mean by that? <laughs> uh, th- they say so much between those two in that conversation without s- having to do anything else. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, field reporter, uh, chief, if I were surrounded by eight or 10 of those things, would I stand a chance with them? And Sheriff McClellan, well, there's no problem. If you have a gun, shoot them in the head. That's a sure way to kill them. If you don't get yourself a club or a torch, beat them or burn them. They go up pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that man. I yeah. just do. <laughs> uh, movie review. This movie is actually visually pretty damn good. For yeah. The time. And we can't undersell the fact that they straight up show not only cannibalism in this movie, which I know is not a thing that was in movies at that time yeah. period. They show a little girl killing her mother in this movie with a trowel. Yes. And then eating part of her father. Yes. Uh, this shit was not a thing. I mean, we, we you can watch it now and say, this shit's tame as fuck. It, it is by today's standards. Yeah. It was not back then. <laughs> not by any measure. And not only that, but it's that saying, you have to start somewhere. And this movie yeah. just came out the gate fucking swinging. The zombies, I mean, they don't have the appearance that, that you have in the, the remake for sure. And I love the remakes like effects. I love the effects in Day of the Dead. I'm not so fond of the ones in Dawn of the Dead with the, the bluish gray makeup. Yeah. But we'll get to that movie when we get to it. This one, the white pale makeup in the black and white movie, it works. It totally works, yeah. Um, and I'll tell you the reason they did black and white. It's because of the the that you know they could cover up more you know with the visual effects romero specifically said too he hated the color of blood at this time that was in colored movies Mm -hmm. it was like it was way too red it's that way in dawn of the dead but he he wanted it to be like cartoony type movie and so it works but he wanted this to be scary and he said that that the blood color was too red too cartoony so he wanted it to be black and white so he could get that hitchcocky and like black you know chocolate syrup type look which oh. is way more realistic at that time period yeah i mean i would say that he was successful in his endeavors uh something else that i don't think he intended with this is that um it's black and white uh actually made it seem more realistic to the people back then because news was black and white back in those yeah, days yeah okay and so it was actually more like it was a documentary or something you would see on the news at night as opposed to being like, you know, a movie. Um, 
And the last reason that it's in black and white is another cost savings thing. Uh, he said that there was labs that were close to them in Pittsburgh that were able to develop black and white film uh, on like 35 millimeter. But if they went to color, the best that they could develop was 16 millimeter, which would have degraded the look of the film, you know, more so than it already was. So he kept it in black and white because it made the movie look the best for the price that they could afford to pay yeah. for it. I, I think it all contributed to so much, especially today, being able to watch this, review it, and understanding everything behind it. Like, I, I never thought about these things. You don't think about these things when you're just watching a movie. You're just like, oh, this is scary, or this is not scary. But you don't really... Sometimes when you hear what's gone into it and the struggle, and we're finding more and more that the lower the budget, like, sometimes the better the film, you have to be more creative. Man. For sure, yeah. Um, and that that's something else that's on, like, the special features and the Criterion disc is they're talking about how actually the budgetary constraints and and actually the inexperience of the, the people making the movie actually worked out in its favor because not only did you get that more realistic look because you went with a black and white for that time period. Yeah. But um, – there's a lot of stuff that they did in this movie because they, I mean, and this goes into the visuals too, that was forced on them. So the camera that they could afford, they couldn't afford to get the sound to record at the same time that they were recording the movie. They had, they had to put it on a tripod. They couldn't move it. So, uh, and they actually do something interesting, whether they meant to or not in this movie, where the scenes where that's supposed to be relatively safe on the people, it's all, it's a static camera. It's just sitting there, you know, what, you know, panning from one person to the other uh, and just kind of, you know, and, and, and the way that they get movement in those scenes is the, ca the actors more than the camera. But when the movie gets chaotic, they, they couldn't record sound during this time, so they had to dub it in later, but they took it off the, the tripod and they did a hand can thing where it was more like, you know, you can imagine like uh, somebody who's filming a documentary would be up in somebody's face yeah. and, and all that. So the movie go, I mean, in the, the safe moments is static in the unsafe moments. It's all like moving around because that's their, their camera limited what they could do. That's fucking wild. <laughs> um, and also, there was a lot of stuff that Romero took from his time making commercials that he integrated in the movie, like the whole scene where Ben's like, you know, building a fire and he's trying to, and he sets the zombie on fire in the way that it focuses on his hands and him like doing all that stuff. That was stuff that Romero did like a, in a lot of his like uh, early uh, commercials that he was filming. And he just took that way of filming and put it into the movie. So it's just kind of interesting that like his. I mean, he he cannot go back and watch this, or at the time, uh, like later in life, he said this movie was the hardest for him to go back and rewatch because he just saw every fucking mistake well, yeah. that, he, that he made. He's, but I, I feel like that's the artist being hard on themselves yes. because he's like, he pointed out, for instance, this in the trivia, there's a scene where two people are talking to each other and they're both pointed left and it's say, you want And he said, you know, it's common knowledge, you know, and he learned that later that if you want two people to appear like they're talking to one another, you have one face and left one face and right. Oh yeah. That, way that, you know, they're, you know, pointed toward, and he's like, they, he had them pointed both in the same direction in That's the movie. Funny. So it, but, and something I noticed is the, and I don't know why they did this. I, I think it's because of the, he was doing everything. Romero was doing like, every, he was even editing the movie, and that's a whole other thing they had to do back in the day where they physically had to cut and actually tape together the, the movie. I don't even know how they do that shit. But, yeah, I've seen um, that. But uh, <clears throat> the zombie that they kill inside of the house that attacks Barbara because it sneaks in on her while Ben's outside taking care of the uh, the other two that had knocked out his uh, headlights. Yeah. When that zombie it gets the, the tire iron through the head, its eyes are closed. When he goes back to pull it outside, its eyes are open, which was really bad for the movie because you can actually see the eyes in the high-definition like version of it. They The eyes move left, and then they go back to the the, the center right before he gets pulled. Oh, that's hella funny. So, just little stuff like that's all through the movie, but, I mean – they were, this was their first movie, so you got to give them some, and for a first movie, it's fucking great. So wait, I got a question real quick, something that's burning in my skull right now. 
So they couldn't do audio while they were recording, so they had to go back and redub their lines. If they did, if oh, they okay. moved the camera, Got if they it. had it on the tripod, then they had like this little bubble like thing that would cover up the camera and they could record sound or whatever. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so a lot of those scenes with a handheld are the scenes that's got the music over them. Okay. If and, you notice in the movie. And it makes sense because, um, you know, the audio is clear in this movie. If there's nothing else, you know, for sure, them speaking, it's nice and clear. So I was like, whoa, man. Uh, the story, moving on from the visuals, um, it's kind of standard now, but like for the day, it was, it's, I mean, this started the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, zombies rise up due to whatever mysterious cause. Uh, they bite you. They spread disease. Because, And that's what I love about this movie. It sets up every zombie trope in one fucking movie. Yeah. Like, it, it does. The Karen gets bit, comes a zombie. Uh, the recently dead rise up. They attack. That's a zombie thing. Shoot them in the head. Takes them out. Uh, they don't really do the burning thing much after this no, movie, though. No, which is, I'm sad. Because I think they took that away, though, because that's kind of an easy way out, almost. It's a dangerous way out, as you can see in this movie. There's a part where the where the house almost catches on fire. Yeah, Ben has to go over and actually, like, tap it out or yeah. whatever uh, at one point. Uh, that or in the remake. I, I get them confused. The point, same. But... I, I'm not sure which one it is, but regardless... But it, but it is the thing, and that and that is something to be that I consider too. Is like maybe they they did didn't do it later on because like the zombies can still walk for a bit after they're on fire. So you set a bunch of them on fire, they walk into the building you're at. Exactly, you're gone. So it could be um, that, but I could care less about that. But I think that it's it's too easy to take them out. You know, with fire, that's you don't run. I, mean, I guess you can run out of ways to set a fire, but it's easier. It's easier to run out of ammo than it is to run out of ways to set something on fire. Uh, that's true. Uh, but they, they do establish, you know, uh, blows to the head, being able to take them out. One one zombie does not, or one dead body in this movie does not follow the rules of this movie, though. Which one? The one that uh, Barbara finds on the stairs. Oh, got it's face you're, eaten off. Yeah, the skeleton one. Yes. Yes, that okay. One, that one should have got back up. That's now, what I was thinking. The animated movie does something that I'm going to talk about when I get to the animated movie that fixes that, but they don't fix it in this. Okay. They don't. Uh, so that zombie or that body should have been a zombie. It okay. should have. I concur. It, <sighs> I hate to bring this up, but in the movie with the long title that I watched, uh, that zombie told Ben where the bathroom was. <laughs> They did a voiceover. Bathroom's down by the kitchen. <laughs> uh, it's funny. When we get to the remake, me and my buddies kind of did that a little bit with the zombies in the remake. Oh, but, God. Uh, I, and I still think whenever I was watching the movie today, I remember uh, my buddy uh, David, like he uh, something he said, but I'll get to it when we get to that movie. Anyways. Um but no, I, every zombie trope is set up in this movie. I, I fucking love it. Like he, I wouldn't he, say it's set up. They set it up for the rest of the zombie movies. Well, I, but what I'm saying is, it's like what I love about it is it formed a whole new genre in Dead. one movie. It's like they wholesale made something new that had never <laughs> been out there before. That I hate that is, so much. I mean, it. it you don't, I mean, it, it's so crazy seeing that in like a, you know, in something like this. Well, especially a 1960s film. Yeah. Uh, but just seeing it in general, because I mean, it's like, you know, I, Bram Stoker, I guess, codified vampires, but like they were a thing way before that. Outside of the, the Smurf thing, this is the only thing that does what it does. Like this is the first thing that does all this. Yeah. Period. Um. And then they're not technically dead creatures in the Smurf thing either. They're infected, which is a whole other thing. Romero was very adamant that if it, if it was infected, then it could run. If it was dead, it needed to be a slow-moving zombie. And I respect his opinion uh, on yeah. that. Yeah, I've never, I have never even thought about that until now. And I don't like that because now we have a bunch of movies we're going to review where they're infected. <laughs> 
You you know what else is Romero said that interview that I thought was hilarious. Uh, somebody asked him, it's like, uh, what do you think about like your creation going on? And he said, well, first of all, it pisses me off. Uh, he says, uh, I used to be the guy that, that was, that, that was my thing. And he said, now everybody else is taking it, yeah. you know, but, uh, but that way he was kind of saying that tongue in cheek, but he did, he did go on to say this. He's like, what are the, what is the point of most of this zombie stuff? He's like, you got the zombie walks, you got all this. He's like, when I, he, he said, I always like to take like a social comment and then base the move, the zombies around that. And then, you know, which he did, he did it to a yeah. great degree. Uh, he said that just making them like the, you know, like the apocalyptic story where you just see the slice of life stuff that inter- that he hated that. Like it had no effect on him. He didn't see the point of it. Um, Would you say but- that the walking dead kind of took a cue from him? Because you could, you could say that the walking dead was, um, the Walking yeah. Dead wholesale stole from this this movie in particular. Yes. They said that I've actually I, I took that out of the trivia I think, but uh, Gail Ann Hurd, who ran The Walking Dead, said that they went back to this movie and established all the rules for The Walking Dead. Okay, off of this, and it makes sense because if you think of almost every fucking episode of The Walking Dead, you could break it down. Everyone has a little bit of something where you know it b- recaps the previous episode. It shows where they're at. Uh, something happens. Oh shit, zombies! You know. Uh, somebody dies or somebody gets, or, you know, X amount of people get away. Um, and, and, then and I they... think Romero would have hated or uh, probably did hate the walking dead, not because just that he wouldn't get paid for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was his concept. And and by the way, it is based on a comic book that Kirkman did, but Kirkman yes. blatantly blazed it on Romero. Oh, zombie, 100%. So. But if you think uh, about it, the story of the walking dead or not the story, but the stories involved with the walking dead, it's not about the zombies. Oh, it's not, but I think Romero's thing was is that he wanted to be like a societal thing that was always presented by the the whatever the zombie thing was. So like Dawn is about consumerism. Okay. That's why it's set in a mall. Day is about the breakdown of like the the you know, basically the society? Stri- the it, well, it's not just society, but it's like, you know, it, when we get to it, it's like the military's breaking down. The science is, you know, scientists have like, you know, not been able to help anything. So it's basically like the stuff that we look to, like the uh, organizations that are supposed to like, you know, control everything and, and be like the ones that we look to for answers. They're, they're fucking worthless in yeah. the event of an apocalypse. So that was kind of his statement on that too. Okay. Um, this movie, which is why I bring it up story wise there's a lot of stuff attributed to this movie that he never intended with this. Uh, and one more thing. Uh, I thought it was funny whenever he was making that comment because he went on to say, he's like, what are we going to see next? A uh, zombie uh, uh, comedy uh, musical. And whenever he said that, I'm like, mm-hmm, Anna and the apocalypse. Okay. But Anna and the apocalypse, <laughs> they, they, they did good. They done did that, good. I know, but it was hilarious that he said that, and then it became a thing, like, right after he said yeah, it, you know. Yeah, that's hell of, well, it, it, Was it, wait, was it right after, or was it, like? No, it was before, because I think Romero died before okay. Anna and the Apocalypse That's what to made. say. I don't think he's seen Anna and the Apocalypse. But he made that comment, and I was yeah. like, they did that. They did it. That's um, so funny. We did it, George. We did it. <laughs> um, But story-wise, People always bring up that this was like clearly an allegory for the civil rights movement movement, and that uh, having Ben as the main character and the fact that he dies at the end of it is like a comment on racism and everything that was going on at the time. Yeah. And Romero has blatantly refused any of that nonsense. Uh, he says that it's, he says that it worked in their favor mm-hmm. and, and the, and, he he hated to feel this way about it, but he they were literally and this is in the trivia they were literally dropping the movie off to have it you know dubbed and all that stuff over you know the night that uh, whenever they were driving back from doing that him and John Russo mm-hmm. they heard that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot and oh they, shit and they, and he said he hated to think this but the first thing that came to his mind was that's probably gonna make this movie more popular. And yeah, and I don't blame him. You don't want something like that to happen. Sometimes it does genuinely just happen. Watching this and also more recently reading about that and seeing how 
you know, uh, it, it, you know, this movie is unintentionally a civil rights thing. I don't think it is. I think people just made it that way. They they did make it that way, and he said that um, he said that he ble- there was actually the French were the one that that brought it up first and got because he said what happened was this movie went out there and it played in the drive-ins, scared people like it was supposed to be to do, and then it was kind of forgotten. And he said the French picked it up and they started attributing all this racial stuff to it because yeah. of the, you know, and he said, then it became super popular in another sense because everybody was like, Oh, they were so visionary. They, they, you know, were working this movie as a, and he said, I did not do that. He said, and that's one thing about Romero. The guy was, I mean, the sweetest person you can meet. Like yeah. you, you always worry about meeting your heroes. You met Romero. He was the, he was like your grandpa. Like he was the sweetest man that ever lived. Uh, whenever you met him and he was very humble and like he, and he straight up said it. He said, I wrote Ben to be a white man. He said, it just so happened that Dwayne was the best actor in our friend group. So we made the main character black and just, and, but didn't switch anything else about the movie. So he said at the end of it, whenever that mob shoots Ben, they were going to shoot a white man. Yeah. There, that, there was no commentary there. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing they attribute to this movie is they attribute the Vietnam War to this movie. Saying oh, it's Jesus. like an allegory to it. <laughs> <sighs> it this is, this is literally just people putting way too much into it. They're overthinking it. And I know he has a little bit of commentary in his films, but like, no, this is this is too much. I'll tell you the commentary he had in the movie. I think that the stuff going on between the Vietnam War and the stuff that was going on with the Civil Rights Movement did influence it, but not in the way everybody gives him yeah. credit for. He was basically watching society break down. Yes. Watching neighbors fight neighbors. Yes. And he put it in the movie, the zombies versus man. And even within the house, the, the people fighting each other. That was just, that was his commentary that society was breaking down at the time that he made this movie. And it fucking was it. I mean, you watch the news during the time. I mean, people getting beat with hoses and all kinds of stuff in the South. Uh, soldiers dying left and right in Vietnam. I mean, like God he had a reason to put that in his movie, but he did not, Make it as like, oh, well, Ben's like a stand. He didn't do any of that shit. People yeah. are just putting that into the movie. Yeah. Some people just do too much, honestly. <laughs> and sometimes it's fun, but sometimes it's just like, okay, well, you can tell when someone's kind of bullshitting because they'll say, oh, I didn't do that. But then, like, they don't, or they just really don't deny anything. And they're just like, ah, just let it go. When somebody's being this genuine about it, that no, it's not what you think it is. At what point do you believe them, you know? I agree with you. And I feel like it's one of those things. And this always pissed me off. Like in English class, you had the English teachers that started describing like, uh, you know, motives and like underpinnings to like works of fiction that could have been there. I'm not saying that they wouldn't, but I think they overinflated them. And, you know, to the point it's like, clearly this is an allegory of whatever. And it's like, maybe it was just the author wanting to make a good fucking story. And it just so happened just like this movie to sync up with events at that time period. And you ascribe that stuff to it. And it doesn't fucking mean any of that, you know? <laughs> yeah. But I guess we really can't stop people from thinking what they want to think. Honestly, no, you can't, but I'm just saying yeah. that it's out there. And, and I think it's way overblown. Like I heard like this black lady in like some interview somewhere else. And she was going on and on about how, uh, you know, Ben is such like the, you know, the allegory for Martin Luther King. And I'm like, Oh my God, he's not. Uh, he ended up being, but uh, that yeah. was pure coincidence. You it, know, it was, it was before it even happened, but y'all don't hear me though. Um, one thing, and I wish Noah was here. Cause I know that he brought this up on wave far back podcast that we did. Maybe even during the, the, uh, Satan season that we did. Uh, but, uh, I, I want to discuss with you like the the templates that each character in this movie represents. So okay. people give shit to Barbara for being the comatose, do nothing person that she is in this movie. But I've heard and and like because and Noah brought it up too that these are all archetypes for how people react yes. to emergency situations. And there are people like Barbara that just freeze up and do nothing. Mm-hmm. You know. I mean, they're useless. Like, I mean, they, they don't, they they retreat inside their mind. And Judith O'Day even said this. That's how she, I think that's in the trivia about how she viewed Barbara. 
is that she couldn't cope. So she mentally retreated. And that's, I mean, you know, and that's a thing that some people do. Yeah. I mean, I try to, I try to put myself in any kind of situation. Well, not any kind of situation, but when I'm seeing zombie films, it's like, how would I react? And I feel like a part of me would be a fighter, but a big part of me would be a screamer, which is what you don't want to be when there's zombies around, you know, attracting attention, et cetera. Um, Everything would make me jump. Everything would make me, you know. You you would be a Helen Cooper, basically, is what you would be. Probably. Because that's what she does in the movie. I mean, she's got some animus to her, but she, you know, she does do some things. But mm -hmm. at the same time, she's mostly just screaming and, you know, and then, of course, being the mother archetype, she's worried about her daughter through most of it. Yeah. You know? I'll tell you what, my daughter gets bit. She ain't coming in this room with me. <laughs> um. Tom is just a every man that like once an authority gives him something to do, like yeah. he, he, you know, he follows it. Uh, him and Judy both are kind of that way in the movie. Uh, she's, but she's a little bit more so on the, uh, what I would like to call the turtling side of it. She like, she's her inability to make up her goddamn mind. Oh ends yeah. Up getting Tom killed, you know, and yeah. herself. But, yeah, that is true. Cause she, I mean, she, at the last minute, it's like, no, I'm going to go with them. And it's like, bitch, uh, even Harry says it to her. It's like, it's too late. You don't go out there, you know? Yeah. And if she would have left them alone. And, and if she hadn't been out there and she hadn't been in the car, the truck, then her jacket wouldn't have got caught, you know, still been alive. Whole other thing. She wasn't um, meant to be alive. Uh, And then we got our two proactive people in the, in the movie but they show the opposite sides of like, you know, how quote unquote, the alphas react. Yes, to stuff. exactly. Be because Ben, I mean, he, he's not like anybody who ascribes to him, like that. He's like the perfect Romero hero. He's not, there is a lot of shit that he does wrong in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't listen to Harry when he should be at times. Uh, and that actually provokes Harry into being even worse of an ass than he already is. I mean, if, if Ben had some humility to himself, then he might have, you know, then, I mean, I'm not saying let Harry run all over you, but, I mean, he's fucking beating Harry at one point. He shoots him. Uh, he's threatening to feed him to the zombies uh, yep. or the ghouls. You got a guy who's already not wanting to work with you. That's not the way to get him on your side is the fucking. That is true. Beat macho bravo bullshit and uh he's he's stubborn like he's a very stubborn character being like i mean you know he's sitting there and you know harry's giving him that information saying yeah okay one of them is weak i will agree with you on that but you get enough together they're going to knock these fucking boards in and then they're going to overrun this place and then ben's just like fuck you i'm i know what i'm doing Okay, but I don't understand the window comment because they got the windows boarded up. Was Harry complaining about the windows being boarded up? He was saying that the windows were pointless because, or the windows were both a negative and, and, and so Ben was trying to argue that they needed the windows to be able to see outside in case they needed to get out of there. Which, and then and, and Harry I, was like, well, yes. you've boarded them up, so you, they're a weak point. And you can't see out of them, so what What good are they, you know? Yeah, but if you're, I guess this doesn't make a ton of sense. I'm, this is my thinking is that there's an upstairs. You could technically view from upstairs. Neither one of them thought of the upstairs in the original movie. Uh, which understandably. Which is dumb as fuck because that's the best place to be at. That's what, yeah. It gives, you, it gives you a way out. And it keeps you away from the zombies. And if you follow the Max Brooks, uh, you know, <laughs> zombie survival guide, if you hack the stairs up, yep. the zombies can't get to you, period. But yes. that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, Love Max Brooks. Hey, guys. Look out for part two of this episode coming to you this Friday. See you then.